Welcome back to the MOOC course on qualitative research methods. My name is Aradhana Malik and I am helping you with this course. We have done a various, uh, you know, we have covered uh, uh, a lot of ground in qualitative research methods and we are nearing the end of the course. So, we are consolidating whatever we had talked about. Today, uh, in these lectures, we will talk about writing as a method of inquiry. Now, writing helps us represent whatever uh, we have interpreted, it also adds to the inquiry, you know, it is an iterative process. Qualitative research especially is, uh, you know, we in qualitative research, we, we keep gaining insights as we progress. That happens with quantitative research also, but qualitative research is more, uh, it is more open ended and uh, it is more interpretive. It is more uh, uh, in line, in tune with the ground reality. So, we discover things as we interpret them, knowing fully well that by the time we interpret the phenomena that we are studying, the situations that we are studying, we will be, uh, whatever we are studying will be historically situated. So, it will be in the past. By the time we understand what we set out to understand uh, and we represent it, we provide our interpretation of the phenomenon we have tried to understand. The, the phenomenon itself will have passed and it would have evolved into something new. It would have taken a very different kind of shape by the time we start talking about it, by the time we start writing about it. And that is the beauty of qualitative research that we say, yes, you know, life is going on and we are taking a slice of life, we are studying it within the context, we are situating it within the context, studying the interaction, knowing fully well that by the time we understand it, we represent it, we share it with the stakeholders, we share it with people who will want to know more about it, it could have evolved into a shape that we cannot probably accurately, 100 percent accurately predict. So, uh, and when we talk about writing as a method of inquiry, writing is a way of sharing our results, writing al uh, is also a way of helping us think some more, writing stimulates our thought process. When we talk about things, when we write them, when we express them, it stimulates our thinking process and helps us develop insights into whatever it is that we are talking about or writing about. So, it is called it's reflexive, hmm. it, it, it feeds into itself and helps us clarify whatever we are talking about. Okay. Now, this is from a paper by Richardson in the Handbook of Qualitative Research Methods. Writing in context, Richardson says, that uh, there are two broad categories of contexts in which we write, they are literary and scientific contexts. Uh, the difference is not whether the text really is fiction or non-fiction, but the claim the author makes for the text in terms of the audience one seeks, the impact one might have on different publics and how one expects truth claims to be evaluated. So, we are looking at, you know, these, these two uh, ways, these two methods of writing differ in the way that, uh, in the, in the way that the, 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 the claim the author makes for the text in terms of who is going to read what is written, in terms of the impact what is written will have on the people it is meant for and how one expects these claims of truth to be evaluated. You know, we make claims, we say this is like this, but depending on how we want to share it with the people who are going to read it, we will write it in a very different way. And when people read it, they make, they evaluate it, they make judgments, they, they, they make their own meaning out of whatever is written. So, it is a meaning of a meaning uh, in a way. So, we, we write with that purpose in mind and the difference is in the way these two these two forms of or uh, the difference is, is in the way the, the reader would like to interpret it. So, we write according to that. Okay. Metaphor, like the spine, it bears weight, permits movement, is buried beneath the surface and links parts together into a functional coherent whole. 
so a metaphor is is a relationship it is a a representation of uh, you know it it helps us get to the core of the activity now i'm using another metaphor so it helps us get to the core of whatever it is that we are talking about it bears weight like the spine bears weight permits movement is buried beneath the surface and links parts together into a functional coherent whole and the metaphor really helps us share the essence of whatever it is that we are talking about theoretical schemata are always situated in complex systematic metaphors for example metaphor theory is architecture leading to the following statements now when we talk about theory when we talk about uh, 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 the the different uh, beliefs or the the way we understand theory we situate it in 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 uh, different metaphors the most common metaphor that is used for theory is architecture so we use words like foundation reminds us of a building we use words like support that reminds us of a building your position is shaky again a building a uh, um, you know um, an architectural structure your argument is falling apart let's construct an argument the form of your argument needs buttressing given your framework no arg no wonder your argument fell apart now all these words that are in italics helps help us visualize theory as an architectural structure similarly when we take any construct any any idea any belief that we are talking about we we take a familiar uh, idea a familiar concept i'm not i'm trying to very hard to not use difficult words here so we take something that is familiar to all of us the metaphor that i personally like to use most is that of a mammal a living being you know uh, so so i'll i may talk about a tree and then i'll say roots and branches and leaves and flowers and fruits and all of those things or a mammal a spine a skeleton hmm, meat muscle skin so these are the things that i would like to use so i i i personally like this you may have a different preference but it's something that everybody can relate to it helps you capture the essence so for example if i am talking to my students about about writing any document say writing an essay let's simplify this writing an essay i like them to start with an outline so i say okay what is it that you're talking about name the animal hmm. i am an animal lover so i'll say name the animal okay it's a dog fine dog now when you write the outline the outline gives you the skeleton of the dog so it will tell you where the skull of the dog is it will tell you where the teeth of the dog are in that skull it will tell you where the limbs of the dog are it will tell you where the tail of the dog is it will tell you where the main spine of the dog is so where are you starting from then you add meat to the body of the dog what do you want to emphasize on is it is it the dog's growl is it the wagging tail is it the bark what exactly are you trying to emphasize on so you know so so that is how i talk to my students about writing uh so this is you know this is one of the ways in which we we uh, uh, write whatever that we are talking about it just adds flavor now I, i'm using the metaphor of food so these adjectives these descriptions add flavor to whatever we are talking about and they help us consolidate whatever we are talking about give us the essence now i'm using the again the metaphor of food hmm. it gave us gives us the flavor it gives us the aroma of the paradigm we are using etc so you know what kind of spices you have used hmm. so this is what a metaphor does to writing okay writing format various formats are used in writing referencing in text end of text and footnotes then when we talk about formats when we are talking about qualitative research the primary s elements of the format are we we would want to know how to reference in text uh, references end of text references and footnotes how are we we addressing the knowledge we have created so the knowledge is constituted as focused problem or hypothesis centered linear or straightforward that is the most preferred way of presenting the new knowledge that has been created it may also be 
presented as inductively accomplished research that is to be reported deductively. The size of the abstract will matter and this is again governed by the publications or by the way in which we publish what we have written and researchers are able to identify explicitly with a theoretical label. This is the most preferred way of presenting the knowledge that has been created. So, we talk about references, we talk about presentation of knowledge in and through our writing. Some conventionals that are uh, conventions that are used in traditional ethnographics are one is experiential authority. The author exists only in the preface to establish I was there and I am a researcher credentials. So, you say that yes, I was there and I observed x, y, z. The other way of presenting traditional ethnography is the documentary style, which is a plethora of concrete particular details that presume to represent the typical activity pattern culture member. So, you say ok, you know this is the totally third person account, this is what happened, that is what happened and you present it in the form of a documentary. Then culture members point of view, putatively presented through quotations, explanations, syntax, cultural cliches and so on, assuming that the other person or the person who is reading your text will be able to relate to your position in that ethnography as an insider, will be able to understand your position as an insider. So, if you write it as from the culture members point of view, you will use the terms that the culture members use and you may use quotations that the, the, the members of that culture are using in an attempt to convey that you understand what you are talking about. As an outsider, you will attempt to clarify things, but as an insider, you will, you are likely to use the same kinds of terminologies, the same kind of quotations, you are likely to talk in the same manner as an insider. Then the interpretive omnipotence of the ethnographer, which means the the other style is that the ethnographer is present, present as an outsider and as an insider and is reflexively going back and forth, is going out of the situation, understanding the situation, going back in and then writing about it, then going out and observing it in third person. So, various ways in which we present the knowledge that has been created. Okay. Why do we follow convention? Now, let us get down to the nuts and bolts. Why do we follow convention? We want to get published we want to get published, we want our work to be known and through publication our credibility, the believability of our work increases. So, that is why we follow these conventions, we follow the tried and tested routes of sharing the knowledge that we claim to have created in and through our efforts with people who can use that knowledge to either further that knowledge or take that knowledge forward and build on that knowledge or use that knowledge to solve their day to day problems. We will talk about it in policy making in the upcoming lectures. Okay. Writing conventions, text based on life histories or in depth interviews, researchers establish their credentials in the body of the text. They write the body of the text as though the document and quotation snippets are naturally present, valid reliable and fully representative rather than selected, pruned and spruced up by the author for their textual appearance. So, when we talk about, when we, when we describe life histories or in depth interviews, we write these things naturally, we do not add quotations, we also do not take out these quotations, we write as if we are just taking a slice of life and presenting it to the reader without spicing it up and without over simplifying, over clarifying whatever it is that we have dealt with. Okay. All right. In the postmodernist context, the core of postmodernism is the doubt that any method or theory, discourse or genre, tradition or novelty has a universal and general claim as the right or the privileged form of authoritative knowledge. Postmodernism suspect all truth claims of masking and serving particular interests in the local cultural and political struggles. So, it opens standard methods to inquiry and introduces new methods, which are also then subject to critique. And when we talk about when we write from the postmodernist perspective, we are open to critique. We say yes, this is something new that I created, but I am open to critique. This is we try and balance out whatever we are writing. We, we accept that there may be points of view that are likely to oppose what we have written and we also 
doubt whatever not doubt, but take the way we represent our understanding of the particular phenomenon with a pinch of salt. We do not appear to be shaky, we do not appear to be to be unsure of what we have written, but we make no secret of our openness to critique of our openness to differing points of view, our openness to revising whatever we have learnt in light of new information that can help us interpret whatever we have understood differently. Okay. Having a partial local knowledge is also knowing and that is what postmodernists believe. Qualitative researchers are accepted as situated speakers. So, we are accepted as situated speakers, we are in the, the uh, social context that we are talking about and the qualitative researchers are accepted as the, the, the speakers from that specific context. Okay. Conventions and post structuralism, post structuralism links language, subjectivity, social organization and power and uh, the centerpiece is language. So, we use language to highlight the, the uh, language subjectivity, we, we, we use language to, to highlight whatever we are talking about. Language does not reflect social reality, but produces meaning and creates social reality. Different languages and different discourses within a given language divide up the world and give it meaning in ways that are not reducible to one another. And language is how social organization and power are defined and contested and the place where our sense of selves, our subjectivity is constructed. So, language assumes the most important place in post uh, structuralist uh, writing. Hmm. Then we, we understand, we focus on text, we focus on competing discourses, we understand language as competing discourses, competing ways of giving meaning and of organizing the world, makes language a site of exploration and struggle. Language constructs the individual subjectivity in ways that are historical and locally specific. What something means to individuals is dependent on the discourses available to them. This is really the meat of this whole idea of post structuralist writing. So, when we are talking about post structuralist writing, we say yes, based on the information I received and my understanding of that information that I received, my usage of the language in which I received this information, my usage of the language, my understanding, my interpretation of whatever was spoken, the texts that were written will help me interpret the phenomenon in a way that I can understand it. And that is where this whole uh, style of writing comes from. So, we refer to texts, we refer to what was spoken as opposed to our interpretation of what we observed. We use language, we use language to understand the phenomenon, we write from the perspective of our we 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 put uh, you know we we focus most on language when we talk about post structuralist uh, uh, writing okay conventions in post structuralism experience and memory of individuals are open to contradictory interpretations governed by social interests and prevailing discourses i may remember something my rendition today is a result of how I interpreted the phenomenon and stored it in my memory and how I was able to retrieve it. It is dependent upon my interpretation of what I read, what I heard and how do I interpret it and store it in my memory by using language. Okay. So, we use language to store the information in our memory. We use language to interpret whatever we need to interpret hmm. and that is really what everything revolves around. The individual is both the site and subject of these discursive struggles for identity and for remaking memory. I understood something, then I went back and said, hmm, did I understand it right? Maybe, maybe not. Why did I understand what I understood? What led to my interpretation of this situation? Okay, it, it was this, it was not that. So, we 
change we modify the way we store things in our memory we may attach new tags now i'm using the metaphor of a computer file hmm. so we may attach tags to whatever we have stored in our memories so we say okay maybe another tag needs to be added to it and when we attach that tag we are again using language so we are using language to to remake our memory because individuals are subject to multiple and competing discourses in many realms their subjectivity is shifting and contradictory not stable fixed and rigid so we allow ourselves to understand the phenomena differently every time we revisit those phenomena that is really the whole crux of this so every time we write something we interpret it we go back we think about it and then we 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 present a, a a much more reflected upon interpretation of what we had interpreted earlier okay suggestions made by post structuralism to qualitative writers it directs us to understand ourselves reflexively as persons writing from particular positions at specific times it also frees us from trying to write a single text in which we say everything at once to everyone so we say yes today i'm writing this but i will leave room for revising for revisiting whatever it is that i have written so we don't claim to know everything at the same time and we say we don't claim that whatever we have interpreted today based on the knowledge we had today is the only truth we say okay maybe tomorrow in light of fresh information in light of fresh understanding this is going to change and that's okay creative analytic practice ethnography creative analytic practice produces ethnographies that include poetry drama conversations readers theater and so on CAP ethnography includes the above and any new ways of analyzing and expressing ethnography to enhance the richness and depth of the analysis and bring it as close to the real experienced reality and this type of ethnography displays the writing process and the writing product as deeply intertwined both are privileged so we talk about the writing process and we also talk about the outcome now it may include various things auto ethnography fiction stories drama performance texts polyvocal texts which is the use of multiple voices as a narrative mode within a text readers theater in which actors do not memorize their parts only vocal expressions are used to help the audience understand the context responsive readings alternative reading of a text between the reader of the group and other members aphorisms which is clever crisp memorable definition of a common truth comedy and satire visual presentations allegory which is a story or picture with hidden meaning conversations layered accounts which is polyvocality we talked about polyvocal texts so polyvocality informed by several layers of consciousness writing stories which are narratives about contexts in which writing is produced for example there is a, a, a writer by the name of Rachel Tour and her work is is uh, about writing she compares writing to running she's a runner and she's also a writer she's a professor she's a faculty and so she she writes about writing and compares it to running and she's written several articles so this is a writing story a narrative a story about writing and mixed genres and this is one of the the examples of or these are some of the the ways in which cap ethnography can happen okay evocative representations display interpretive frameworks that demand analysis of themselves as cultural products and as methods for rendering the social so through evocative representations we find ourselves attending to feelings ambiguities temporal structures sentences blurred experiences and so on we struggle to find a textual place for ourselves and our doubts and uncertainties and we can experience the self reflexive and transformational process of self creation for example auto ethnography and writing stories so these are stimulating our writing process evocative representations stimulate our writing process and help us bring out something different okay writing stories are narratives about context in which writing is produced they situate the author's writing in other parts of the author's life such as disciplinary constraints academic debates departmental politics social movements 
community structures, research interests, familial ties, etc. They evoke new questions about the self and subject. I would really encourage you to write to read uh, Rachel Tour's work to see what writing stories look like. They sensitize us to the potential consequences of our, all our writing by bringing home inside our homes and workplaces the ethics of representation and it offers each writing story offers its writer an opportunity to make a situated and pragmatic ethical decision about whether and where to publish the story. Okay. Micro process writing stories uh, talk about how does the process of writing passages and reading them back to yourself open new questions and issues that feedback and emanate from the earlier passages. Now, how is a changed self evoked through the hands on eyes on feedback process and computer technology helps um, us think more about writing. How are the choices made with what impact on the reader? How does the ease of manipulating page formats and typographical style contribute to or distract from the evocativeness of the text? author's discoveries about text, what is this technology doing to the way I am thinking about writing, how is it facilitating my writing, how is it hampering my writing, if so how the color I choose, the style, writing style I choose, the, the, the animations I may like to add, you know, so what, how is this impacting the way I am thinking about writing and expressing my writing. Okay, and that is all uh, we have time for in this lecture. So, do think about the top points we have discussed and I would maybe I can spend a minute showing you Rachel Tour's work. I think we have that time. Let me just show you. It will take maybe, uh, maybe 30 seconds if this computer works. Okay, let us see. So, let me show you Rachel Tour's work. She has done very, uh, you know, she writes a lot about writing and, and um, here. So, she talks about writing and running and maybe we can see this, what writing and running have in common and she publishes her work in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Some parts of the Chronicle of Higher Education are available free of cost to non-subscribers. If you want to subscribe it, maybe your library can subscribe to it. Uh, you know, there is a different subscription rate for students. So, let us see if the page opens up. If not, then maybe you can go through it on your own. I have a link that I have put in the slides. Yeah, it is coming up. Okay. So, what writing and running have in common? At the beginning of every race and every book project, the same thought occurs, this is impossible. So, she talks about, uh, you know, how running has helped her become a good writer and she's written many, many articles about this. So, so you can maybe read, she's, a, she's an associate professor of creative writing at Eastern, Washing, uh, Eastern Washington University and her website address is mentioned here. So, maybe you can go through her work and see what writing stories are like, what writing narratives look like and it will be very interesting for you to see how this is also another form of, of uh, qualitative inquiry. So, thank you very much for listening and we will continue with this discussion on writing as a method of inquiry in the qualitative, in qualitative research in the next class. Thank you.